right, people, we're back. We're live and in full effect. Victory and Vice's podcast, me, Rory Spooner. You see James Vec with me again. No Reese Henley. He has scheduling conflicts we couldn't make today. But again, as you can see below, a very special guest, Mr. Simon Cox. This is uh, one we've been trying to plan for a while now with obviously the time differences. And uh, we were buzzing to have you on, mate. So thank you so much again, like I said, for taking time out of your day and, and having a chat with us. Um, I suppose, again, an excellent place to start is how are you keeping, mate? How is life in Australia? Brilliant, mate. Really good, actually. Um, listen, this uh, is probably the best place to be in the world right now. Uh, we've been opened up for, for a very long time, uh, yeah. probably about two or three, four months, maybe. Um, and we've been pretty much going uh, the way our day should be uh, for, for a while. So the bars and the pubs are open, which is always nice. And, uh, and oh. stadium, stadiums are open, so people are allowed to come watch the games and stuff. So it's, it's really good. And the weather helps as well. Yeah, yeah. The, uh, the COVID situation is interesting because we spoke with loads of players that are really struggling, you know, physically. They just, it's, it's, they have to train by themselves and, you know, they're not able to do what they want to do. And it differs, I suppose, from country to country. I think we, we mentioned Helen Ward before we came on. She's had to train alone. I, I don't even know what Norbert or Solano was doing with the Peru national team. He could have been doing absolutely anything, quite frankly. And, uh, <laughs> and Nicky Hunt came on and he just said, well, I'm having a beer and a Chinese most nights. So that's, <laughs> that's his that's recovery. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it does differ. I was going to ask you, obviously, because there's a lot of admiration in the UK now for how Australia has handled COVID. And like you said, you know, you're all back up and running. So it hasn't really impacted on too much then from a football standpoint. Is that the case? No, there was, we uh, we took capacities down from obviously 100%. We took it down to 25%. And obviously, depending on where and how big your stadium is, still people allowed in. But, yeah. you know, for, for COVID safety, people were still, uh, um, still quite far apart in the stadiums. But it was still nice to have people in. I don't think there's been a game um, that we've played in or any of the teams have played in where there hasn't been anybody there. Um, so that, yeah. that's good. Um, so it's it's been it's been really well done over here. I have to admit, um, just in just in general terms, you know, having to come in when you come into the country, you have to do your two weeks quarantine mm. period. There's no there's no other way of, of getting around that unless you're super wealthy and you you sort of put your money where <laughs> you mouth and you uh, you get around it somehow. But yeah, um, yeah. but majority of everybody else is uh, is stuck in a hotel or a um, or a house or, or or an apartment somewhere and, and you do your two weeks and and that, and that's not just for everybody else that uh, that's not just for them that's for everybody else's safety yes. so we get around it and uh but then once you're out of that the freedom starts and you oh. and you go about your day oh, um, and pretty much everyone's straight to the park <laughs> You like that word freedom, right? You don't know what it means to us right now for when that comes, because for you it's normal, but for us still being locked down and yeah. with restrictions, it's it's an absolute. We are, we're, we're still living in a world where it's it's a big victory if we're allowed to go to somebody else's house yeah. at the moment or somebody's yeah. back garden. They, yeah. they announced in this when they brought yeah. forward two houses can mix. And we're like, ah, this is brilliant news. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, when but, you go uh, from allowing six people to a house to ten people, it's like yeah. a victory. It is oh, yeah. massive. It's, it's a small, it's a small, it's a small W on the board that we have to take <laughs> right now. <laughs> so yeah. We, we, yeah, we we can live with. Take it. them, you take them any way you get them. Though. That's yeah, it. Yeah, exactly. You take it any way you can get it. But mm -hmm. um, yeah, like I said, the admiration for Australia and New Zealand in particular back here. I don't know if you necessarily hear about it too much, obviously being over there. But it's yeah, the envy get, of the world. The, uh, yeah, you get the uh, the dribs and drabs, uh, but you get the. The loyal source of the Daily Mail, uh, <laughs> the truth that is Daily Mail. So yeah, you, you get you get to see. Ah uh, 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 yes, that uh, that pillar of uh, of truth, the Daily Mail. Yes, then, <laughs> yes, yeah. Well, obviously Australia, for logical reasons, I can imagine weather-wise, it was an easy move. I mean, that's not exactly a hard sell. But um, when you left the UK to go obviously play abroad. Did you have more than one option? Was there any of that Chinese money on the table, or was it primarily just Australia? No, to be honest, it was it was something that um, came up uh, the summer before I left in in the sort of January uh, window in the UK. So mm. um, because I still had a year on my contract left, and I, I wasn't able to leave, and um, Australian clubs they they 
predominantly don't buy anybody. They normally get people who are on free contracts or mm. have been out, uh, have just finished their contracts. So, um, so it wasn't feasible in the summer window. But then when when we got to sort of January, um, and I wasn't playing that much at, at South End, obviously Sol Campbell would come in and and mm. wanted to go a different direction. So it was one of those you sit down with the family, and in all honesty, I'd, I'd never even thought about coming to Australia. Never really. Mm. Always thought it was too far away. Do you know what I mean? It was, yeah. you, know, you know how we've we've tried to do this. It's the time difference of like speaking to people at home and uh, all of that sort of stuff. But once sort of we got our heads around going and uh, and how we were going to work it in an ideal world, um, you know, with flights and everything else, we're going to have people coming out left, right and centre, but obviously with the COVID situation, that sort of put pay to that. Um, yeah. But listen, it was, it was a, as soon as I landed and we just, uh, we, we just finished the bush, bushfires. Um, I, don't, I don't know if you guys will remember them. Like oh, last I year. vaguely remember actually. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. Like a long time ago now. Whole, yeah. Yeah. Devastating to the whole country. Obviously people's livelihoods were ruined and stuff. Um, but it, it basically brought astronomical heat to the country. Um, yeah. So I landed from the sunny, <laughs> the sunny, warm weather of the UK to absolute ridiculous 40 degree heat here yeah. in Australia. So, you know, I, I walked off the plane, pasty white to, into a blaze of heat. Um, and then you, you sort of get put into, into training and you've got to try and find your, your second wind. Um, but yeah. it, was, it was, you know, once you're out there for a few, a few days and a couple of weeks and stuff you sort of get used to it and uh and listen i've, I've really enjoyed it since i've come in yeah the uh the idea from a lot of footballers that we've spoken to or sort of the logistical side of the move is like when we spoke to nicky hunt nicky hunt i think moved from bolton to bristol and just moving down south threw him for a loop it completely threw him the logistics he didn't enjoy it he was away from family and then i think when me and reese the other lad that does a podcast with us um oh Vecchi, you were there actually as well were you for the matt jarvis interview yeah, yeah. i can't even remember now but yeah the matt jarvis interview i think matt jarvis was on about uh, there was potential move to Villarreal, real um, but it never sort of panned out that way for him and it, i think again a lot of people don't fully appreciate <laughs> the logistics of moving that far from home and it is yeah. a big move and um I admire you for it because, like you said, it's not easy with the flights and the time difference. It really is difficult. Yeah, yeah. I think I think the thing is as well. One thing for me, like you, know, you speaking to Matt Jarvis about Villarreal, one thing that really sold it to me though is Australia is an English speaking country. Yeah, um, I think had it been a China or a Japan or or an Asian country or even Spain or somewhere like yeah. that, it's very difficult. You have to sort of be in it a hundred percent if you're going to go to a foreign speaking country, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, whereas here, yeah. you know, Australia, New Zealand, America, Canada, do you know what I mean? Any of those sort of English speaking countries mm. would make it a little bit easier to sort of settle in. Um, just so you can make friends, you can converse with everybody yeah. straight away. That's, that's a big thing. I think straight away. Mm. Yeah. Oh yeah. Try to make you one. Yeah. Um, I was, was going to ask, um, obviously with you moving over to Australia, how, how have you found the, uh, um, sort of the difference in quality of football, quality of the leagues. Um, is, is it a different style of football over there compared to where you were before? Yeah, I mean, it's it's probably the question I get asked the most out of of any question, mm. apart from how is it. It's uh, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, it's it's it is different. Um, but I I always say to people that if you got the championship to play in you know, humidity, the way that we do and, mm -hmm. uh, and the heat that, you know, the way that we train in the heat most days. And I said like the, the championship level would slow down. Yeah. It would have, to, yeah. you can't, you can't train and play at that intensity um, without blowing up after 35 minutes, 45 minutes. Um, so, but every team over here tries to play the same way or tries mm -hmm. to play the right way. I, I'd say, you know, it's, it's more, play out from the back and there's no six foot seven centre forwards <laughs> over here and you got defenders kicking it, you know, lumps yeah. up under the pitch and you're getting bashed up. There's none of that. It's, you know, try and play the right way. That's the way the coaches are being taught on mm. the on the badges and that over here. So that's the way they want their teams to play. Um so it's it is different, but it's 
it's a good style of football. It's not, um, like I said, it's not crash bang wallop football mm. that you get some in the lower leagues and stuff in the UK. Um, and it's a, it's, it's a league that I would 100% recommend to, to any of the players who are either, you know, half debating a move out over here or, um, you know, have ever thought about going abroad. It's some, somewhere where you can go and produce some good football. Yeah, I watched the game the other night, actually. It was against Adelaide United, I believe. Is that right? Yep. Yeah, and I believe you scored as well, am I right in thinking? Yeah, came on and, and got one, yep. Form is temporary it's been a while, classes. Mate. It's been a while. <laughs> yeah, yeah, look, hey, form is temporary class is permanent. I watched it and I was like, he knows where the onion bag is still. Yeah. <laughs> That's what they tell me, mate. That's what they tell me. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what, what really surprised me, though? And I suppose we're quite ignorant to sort of the smaller leagues because I remember Ian Hume talking to us about playing in India and he said mm. they're just fanatical about football and he said it's just the most incredible experience. And I watched the game you were in the other night, um, obviously doing a bit of due diligence for this. And I just sat there and I went, well, I have thoroughly enjoyed this. It was a brilliant yeah. game to watch. It was really, really good. And I remember thinking I would like to watch a bit more of this. Do you think there's enough exposure on sort of Australian football over here? The thing is, again, it, it comes down to the time difference. Yeah. I mean, at the, with, the, with the clocks changing and stuff, it's, it's quite nice. It's a mm. three-hour time difference. Oh, not three hours, but like it's... Yeah, yeah. So yeah. what is it? Seven o'clock here is 10 o'clock in, yeah. uh, in the morning for you. So... We would normally play at this time in the evening, so yeah. 10 a.m. in the morning is a nice time. But if you're playing at five, it's like sometimes it's like 3 a.m. Do you yeah, know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. No, no one's getting up for that. It doesn't matter how fanatic <laughs> of a, a football fan you are. You know, you're not getting up for that. I, I, yeah. I definitely would anyway. Do you know what I mean? So um, it would it would be it would be something that people would watch, especially especially this year. I think we've it's been very rare that we've had a nil-nil draw. So you, mm. you, you get goals, uh, which is great because everybody wants to see goals. Um, you get some, you get some bad defending. You get some good defending. You get some good forward play. It's uh, you get a bit, a bit of mixture of everything. So it's yeah. uh, it is an exciting league, but it's because of the time difference for the UK, especially. It's it's just a bit, a bit bad for for the people back there. Yeah, I can imagine. How have the um the Australian public taken to football or, or soccer, shall we say? Because it's yeah. a country that is uh is dominated by sport, I suppose. You know, you look rugby league, yeah. rugby union, Aussie rules, okay. uh, yeah. athletics, cricket, football. You know, there's so much that they do, and there's so much that they're good at as well. They're not like an average sport in nation. You know, the success sort of almost comes naturally to them. Do they gravitate quite heavily towards you no know, the league in general? Um. Not not as much as we would want them to. Yeah. Um, you know, we played Adelaide the other night um, and then they had, I think they had an AFL game. They've got two uh, AFL teams in their, in their state. Yeah, yeah. And I think they, I think they get 60,000 for both teams. Really? Whereas we had, we had something like 5,000 at the game. Yeah. So yeah. there is a big discrepancy in, in, in terms of people going to the games. Um, but the only way that, you get people going from AFL into, into football um, is by getting people to come over people with probably bigger names, mm. getting more excitement into the, into the games and stuff. And then, uh, and just keep going from there. Um, nobody wants to see nil, nil draws. So, so we, we try yeah. to, we try to put them on. Um, but yeah, like they, we just need to get more people to the, to the games as, as we, as we can and how, how we do that. I don't know. It's uh it's not really for, for me to, to decide that. It's more for the uh, the powers that be. Yeah, yeah, no, most definitely. It's like you say, I think, you know, it's a combination of getting big names in and then supplying the facilities um, and the interest at a grassroots level um, and let the kids then sort of build themselves from, you know, six, seven, eight into that culture and really become involved in it. With um, yeah. the Australian national team, again, obviously, you know, not the most successful national team given the standards they set in other areas. Are there any? Has there been any sort of standout players for you from the Austra in terms of Australian players where you come in and thought, "Wow, he's actually a bit of a player." I didn't realize that. Um, I mean, listen, the, the league's littered with good players. Mm. Uh, it, it really is. It's not. It, it was really strange actually because I, I sort of I watched two or three games before I came and I was a little bit like, 
oh, this would this would be a good league to play in for for me personally. I thought I'd come over, score loads of goals, and then just be like, oh, that that was <laughs> thanks very much. Um, yeah. I came in and it was a lot more difficult than I thought it was going to be. Um, so I mean, there's we we've got we've got a few we got a few good young young defenders. We got a young right back who's. Um, who's been with us for, for a few years. He's had interest from, from the UK. Mm. Um, young midfield player again, who's, who's had a lot of interest from, from European clubs as well. Um, but most teams, most teams over here have got a good nucleus of, I'd say four or five young Australian players mm. um, who probably don't get the recognition in the UK. Yeah. But it's actually strange because they go to Europe quite a lot. They go to like Holland and Belgium and, Denmark and those kind of places. Yeah. So they sort of step in stone those places to then try and get to the UK. I got you, yeah. Yeah, it's uh, it's interesting, isn't it? Because Australia is such a beautiful place. So to actually want to leave and go somewhere else, some people might find that strange, but I suppose, like you said, <laughs> the ambitions they have is to play in Europe for a few years and, and really make a name for themselves. Yeah, I think, it's, uh, I think it's actually a little bit harder than what I found to come here to Australia. <sighs> Yeah. You've got your path and away you go. Like they can't, they can't actually leave to go to Europe unless you've. Like there's so much logistical. Uh, yeah. It's a bit of a logistical nightmare for them to to leave. You have to have certain number of rules and regulations ticked off before you can actually leave. So for them, it's actually a little bit more difficult than what it was for me to come here. Yeah, yeah, no, of course. Now, speaking of football on the international scene, this one is quite close to my heart. Now, with an Irish mother and my family and 90% Irish, I, I was fascinated to talk to you about international football, right? Because I would have supported that Irish team since I was a kid, right? So for me, this is this one is this is superb. This is like the holy grail. I'm gonna have my family <laughs> texting me later non-stop <laughs> so with international football I was curious to ask you how it works right because obviously I can't speak on behalf of Aki now because I don't know his you know his, his DNA and his gene pool but I can speak on behalf of mine so <laughs> um, international football and sort of a dual nationality so to speak obviously I could play for Wales or I could play for Republic of Ireland now with my mother being Irish I was curious to know in terms of the Irish side of your family is that on your mother's side or your father's side father's side father's side was your father Irish or was it sort of grandparents my grandparents so my dad was obviously born in the UK yeah um, I was obviously born in the UK so my nan was was born in Ireland she moved yeah. over to England when she was very very small and um and yeah that's how that sort of allegiance came around and um and yeah that was <laughs> that was where it all started really yeah do you know what? Because I am, um, I, I always remember watching. Um, have you seen Mike Bassett? Mike, Mike Bassett, yeah. And, and they, and they all meet in the airport, and they go, oh, "Here comes the England B team." <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I always watch that, and it, it just makes me smile. And I yeah. think to myself, I probably have been a part of one of those sort of B team conversations if I ever. <laughs> but yeah, the um, the situation where you sort of pledge allegiance to the Irish team. Did the Irish FA get in touch with you and sort of sound you out about it? Or do you let them know, actually, I've got a little bit of Irish blood. Do you want to give me a game? I think, yeah. <laughs> yeah that as well. um, no, it's, um, it's, it's, it's done pretty well behind the scenes, actually. Yeah. Obviously, they do their due diligence on, on who, can, who can play and who can't play and who's got Irish grandparents and who's got... Yeah. Um, you know, who's been to Ireland once or twice who might follow. <laughs> um, but, uh, but no, it's, um, I got, I got a call one day um, from somebody who worked in the, in the back office and, and they said, oh, um, you know, we've, we've heard that you qualify for Ireland. Is that true? Um, if so, can you send us through your passport and your birth certificates and all that yeah. sort of stuff? Um, you know, if in the future you get a call up, um, then we, we're ready to go for, for everything that you need. Um, I don't think they do that if in the back of their mind, their mind that you're never, ever going to get a call up. So yeah. um, so they do it for people who they thought would would one day potentially get a call. Um, yeah. So when that, that sort of call came through, you sort of already knew that you were in the thinking. Um, mm. and uh, And yeah, it was... You know, I got I got the call uh, about 
well, about three or four weeks before the end of the uh, the season um, that I was going to be in the provisional 32-man squad for the, the two friendlies that we had at the end of the season, mm. um, Northern Ireland and, and Scotland uh, in the Carlin Nations Cup. Um, and then we had a friendly and a, and a European qualifier as well. So um, I was going to be in the squad for that. Um, and, you know, I was, I was already ready to go and um but I had my holidays booked. <laughs> I literally <laughs> yeah. had I, I was off to Marbella with a group of friends um like two or three days after the season and I had to obviously had to cancel them because you're always going to cancel your holidays to to yeah. go and represent your country. So uh so yeah that was <laughs> that was a quite different <laughs> uh, start of the holiday than I expected. Yeah, yeah. Put in Marbella on pause for that. I think we'd all do the same, unless it's a That's very it. good Marbella holiday. Which, like, <laughs> I may have it probably would have been a good Marbella trip, though. That was the <laughs> Yeah, no, that's true. The uh, Like I said, the whole thing fascinates me because I'm just sat there thinking to myself, how are the Irish team finding out this information? Like, did, where do they get your family tree from? Do we even establish that? Oh, sh- Probably do, Wikipedia. Do, I think. <laughs> do you know what I mean, though? Because I'm sat there thinking, like, there's a, there's some some old bird in an Irish <laughs> office in Dublin somewhere, just <laughs> frantically trying to look through Simon yeah. Cox's. Who do we? Know, yeah. his, his what position do we need? Yeah, well, we will take him. Yeah, yeah, he, he yeah. looks good. Yeah, I've always yeah. wondered. Uh, no, I, I I couldn't tell you to be honest how it how it actually starts, um, unless it's a uh, unless it's like an agent. Uh, that might have thrown your name in at one point or yeah you know whatever that because I to be honest I tried to play for Ireland um underage teams as well so that's oh, why they okay that might that's be, why yeah. they probably uh like found out from from where my background yeah. a little bit so um that that might have been for me but in terms of you know anybody who's been uh who was born in the UK who's got Irish grandparents I don't know how their sort of situation evolves really yeah. It's like you said, Spoon, there. somebody comes into the office one day with a sheet of paper and says, uh, we need a left back <laughs> and a striker. And yeah. Some lady on the computer is Googling. <laughs> Strikers are born in Anyone. Anyone. Yeah. Anyone. Yeah. Anyone. Anyone. <laughs> Someone. Yeah. yeah. Surely we'll just stick 50 names in a hat and pick one out and then we'll see who sticks. <laughs> It's interesting yeah. how it works, isn't it? Because obviously, ja- I think Jack Grealish played at an age grade level for Ireland, and they were they were adamant he's Irish. And then all, obviously he became the player he is now and went to England. And then I think Declan Rice won Irish Young Player of the Year as well. And then Declan Rice said, "Actually, no, I'm not going to bother with this anymore." So, did you have any regrets? He played a senior game as well, Declan Rice. Is it? He played, yeah, but because it was a friendly, it didn't, it sort I didn't of doesn't count. count. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Do you know I was yeah. going to ask you about that actually? Obviously, with with it being a friendly game, if you had played that friendly game and then England had said, "Actually, Simon, we want you," w- would that would it would you have had a decision to make, or would it have just still been Ireland? Do you think? No, nah, not for not for me. I would have. I, it would always always been Ireland for me because yeah, it, it, I think it meant it meant a lot to me to to represent your country, and I think once you've once you've put one. Jersey on, yeah. I think that's your jersey then. Yeah, uh, yeah. Very, it's very difficult. I think to to turn around and go, ah, no, nah, that one's forget yeah, that one. I'm going, yeah. I'm going this way. You know, I think that's yeah. a. I think I don't think that's right. Yeah, it's a it's a trend, I suppose, that is happening more and more. I think Diego Diego Costa was with Brazil and Spain. Am I right, Becky? Just going to say, that? yeah, and just going to bring that up. And then, obviously, uh, Declan clearly didn't have that conversation with you about. It. <laughs> 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 but uh, yeah, no, it, it's fascinating. Yeah, yeah, it's it's the whole thing. I was desperate to ask that because we I've never actually had a conversation about it, and I remember thinking to myself, how on earth did they find out that he's got Irish blood? Just how? But no, you give some great insight, mate. Thank you. Um, going back to the Irish team as well. Obviously, it's a tricky one, isn't it? Right, because obviously. I, with my going over to, to Ireland every summer, I know what the national team means to them. It means the world, but at the same time, it's very much like Australia in a sense that the other sports do dominate the country. Like they're very good at rugby now, for example. Irish, you know, Gaelic games, you know, hurling and and um, uh, Gaelic football. You know, the whole country stops on Saturday for two things: for mass and for Gaelic games. So trying to then engage those young lads. Um, I suppose from a from a young age in soccer or football is difficult because there's a lot of choices. What was your take on the 
sort of the Luxembourg performance when they lost the other night? You know, I, I think I think since since they made the decision to get rid of Mick, um, yeah. I think they've um, they've gone downhill a little bit. Uh, yeah. um, I think they've lost a purpose. Um, I th- honestly think if Stephen Kenny stays in charge. He has to be given the time, but ultimately he needs to be judged on results and results aren't coming at the minute. Um, yeah. and, that's, and that's an issue. Um, so it's it's a tough one because do you keep chopping and changing your manager to try and find the right formula? But you see what it means to the Irish public and what it's like to qualify for a tournament. Mm. And they're, they're going to miss out quite spectacularly on mm. the route. Uh, the World Cup, and obviously they, they missed out on the yeah. um, the playoffs for the Euros as well. So it's uh, they're missing out on two tournaments quite spectacularly, and that's uh, that's an issue. Um, yeah. Need to try and find a formula and try and find it quick. Um, but now I guess with the fact that they're not going to the next two tournaments, they've got a bit of time mm-hmm. to go through, pick a certain amount of players, um, stop sort of. Mixed and matching 32 players every, you know, it's not, it can't be a different 32 every time. It's got to be the same one so that by the time you get to the next European Championships after the World Cup, these players have had a lot of time to play with each other. You found a formula that works. You've got an opportunity to qualify for, for a major tournament again. And that's, and that's what it means to, to the public. And, and hopefully that's what it means to the players as well. Yeah, yeah. I think again, it boils down to the grassroots level. Like I said, trying to get those kids engaged and sort of giving them pathways into uh, into the game because, like, the Irish league is you know it's not that great. I mean, it's okay. The standard is 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 not brilliant. So for the ambition for a lot of those kids would be to go to you know your Manchester United, your Liverpool's, or or anywhere else for that matter. I mean, to me, looking at it when I watched it, I was hugely disappointed watching the game purely, as I say with an Irish family because I know what it means to the Irish public for them to go to those tournaments and they add so much to those tournaments as well. Oh. And um, I, I just remember thinking, I was thinking, God, they're, they're at least a decade away from doing anything right now. If, if, and that's if they get it right. I mean, if they get it wrong, it could be a really long wait because a lot of these smaller nations now, like you said, they're finding the formula and they sort of, they, they're getting it together and, they're really making things happen. And it just goes to show, doesn't it, that, you know, you can get left behind very quickly if you don't get things in place. Yeah. Yeah. And there's, and there's, I mean, when I was obviously in the, in the Island set up as well, there was, there was teams that are above Ireland now mm. that we were, we were beating. Yeah. And you're looking, and you're looking at it now and going, it, like you said, it's going to be a while before they're, uh, they're even considered a, not, not even a favourite to to qualify, but even given half a chance, um, yeah. and that's and that's an issue. That's that's the problem I think right now. Um, so they have to try and find something. Um, mm-hmm. If Stephen Kenny's the man, Stephen Kenny's the man. If he's not, then you've got somewhere around six years to to try and find the, <laughs> the rocket formula. Yeah, yeah. No, that that's a very valid point. Yeah, hopefully you know they can hit the reset button and. Um, and find that formula, you know, God willing, but this is a big ask. Um, going on to um, to club football as well now, because obviously your club career is something we really wanted to touch upon too. Um, in terms of um, sort of your uh, your initial stages of your career, I noticed obviously when I was going through it, you went out on loan. And I, well, am I right in thinking those loan moves uh, sort of helped you become the Simon Cox that you wanted to become? Was that a fair shout? Yeah, absolutely. Um my first loan move was to Brentford um, and I first went out on loan as a central midfield player. Yeah. Um, so I was, I was at Reading at the time and um, I was sort of fluctuating between playing as a sort of nine or a 10 in mm. that league, in, at sort of um, youth team and reserve team level, uh, as well as playing as a sort of box to box midfield player. So, you know, one week you play as a, as a striker the next week you play as a, as a midfield player and and just just purely and simply on the basis of you know what what players we had available and whether the the first team manager needed players to get minutes in in the reserve team and stuff so mm. it was a chance for me to go out on loan um and Brentford was is only up the road from from Reading so that was nice I was able to stay at home 
Um, but it didn't really, well, it didn't work out at all. Um, so I went as a central midfield player and, and to be able to get that experience of playing in front of crowds every week to fighting for three points, you know, to helping people or knowing what it means to people. Um, because ultimately, if you don't win and you, you know, you don't get the win bonuses or yeah. if you don't play, you don't get your appearance bonuses on top of your wages, people's mortgages and, you know, heating bills and all that sort of stuff, they don't technically get paid or, or mm. whatever the case may be. Um, you know, that was vital, valuable for me. Um, like I say, it didn't, it didn't work out, but just in terms of um, building myself and putting my, my own sort of showcase on, on, uh, on the map, it was, it was vital experience for me. Yeah. Yeah. Going back to what you were saying, obviously about vital experience um, with the Welsh national side. Now, I don't know if you've heard of him at all as a player called Dylan Levitt. Have you heard of him played for Manchester United? Nope. No, so Dylan Levin, anyway, plays for Manchester United and Wales. So he's part of the Welsh national team. So he's gone on loan currently from uh, Manchester United to uh, a team in Croatia. So I don't know an awful lot about them. But it's an interesting move. And it got me thinking, obviously, when I looked at your loan moves as well, is there such a thing as a bad loan move? Because even in its worst case scenario, you'll grow a lot as a person. Would that be a fair show? Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the thing is, you, you do go out to play. Mm. Uh, that's the main thing um, yeah. but I think now, nowadays um, nowadays you you can pick and choose your, your loan clubs yeah, um, yeah. whereas back in the day when I was going out on loan it was basically who wanted you um, mm. and it, it didn't really matter like I'm going back to the Australian league it doesn't really matter if there was a six foot six centre forward or seven foot two centre half you know these days you Let's say, for instance, you're, you're Swansea and you, mm. you play the sort of ticky tack of football. Yeah, yeah. You've got a young young lad there. I, we took one at South End. We took a young lad from from Swansea. Um, I can't remember his name now. King, King. Yeah, last name was King. Yeah. Um, and uh, never really played for us, but we didn't really play that style of football either. Yeah. So you're not gonna send. It's like it's it would be like sending a Man City player. To like a Stoke, yeah, yeah, I got you, yeah, yeah. It, it doesn't work, you yeah. know. So, so the loan move for the boy at United, they probably looked at that that Croatian team and gone, oh well, they they sort of play a similar style to us, yeah. And he's probably going to get a valuable experience going abroad for one, yeah. Different culture, different country, different language, mm -hmm. all that sort of stuff. But he's going to get the same sort of education as what he would get at Man United. Mm -hmm. In, in that team in Croatia. And he yeah. probably wouldn't get that at a League One or a League Two or a Championship club, whichever club he went to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's interesting. The loan, the loan side of the game fascinates me because there's so much you can learn just on a personal level. Like you said, I can't remember who I, um, I had the conversation with. Um, I don't know who it was, but as they basically said something along the same lines as you. They were like, this is men's football. This isn't under 23s. This isn't under 18s. You know, there's lads out there. they got mortgages to pay. They're not pulling out of tackles, you know. You might get an yeah. elbow in the face because the bills need to be paid. And I remember yeah. thinking, you know, that for a lot of those young lads, especially I think a lot of the young English lads have copped on to that more. You know, you look at Bellingham and Sancho and all of them. They're not content with just being sat on the bench anymore and, and earning a, a very high wage. They're like, no, let me get out there and play. And I think that attitude was missing for a while with a lot of young players. Yeah, absolutely. And, they, and they've done it... Um, <clears throat> excuse me they've done it at a club where predominantly they are very a young team Borussia mm -hmm. Dortmund um, yeah. so they go in and they fit in around the sort of age group that, that they've got um, but imagine Jaden Sancho going on loan from I think it was at City at the time yeah. and he's gone he goes to I don't know let's say Forest or Reading or someone like that mm. so he, he, yeah he's probably going to tear up the championship and stuff like that but What's he? What experience is he going to get there? Really? Yeah. yeah. Now he's playing with elite, one of the best clubs in in Germany. Yeah. Plays in the Champions League every every season. Mm. You know his stats are phenomenal. Jude Bellingham was he seventeen? He's absolutely yeah. flying. Do you know what I mean? It's like one of those. You take that leap of faith that you you're good enough and you feel you feel like you're going to go out there and and 
do do well. Yeah. And then it's up, and then it's up to you and you sort of fit in as, as much as you can. Yeah, yeah. No, it's very true. The loan moves, obviously, they stood you in good stead and then, you know, it kind of evolved then and that's where, obviously, you started to really pick up form. In terms of the clubs that you played for, obviously, just looking at, you know, Swindon, West Brom, Norwich, Reading, was Reading the one you sort of had the biggest affinity for? Yeah, obviously, Reading being my hometown, um, when I um, when I started, obviously, I went from the age of nine all the way through to sort of 20, um, and then obviously did my rounds and ended up coming back there um, to come to come back was was special for for me, my family, obviously friends and from school and all that sort of stuff. So when you know when I needed tickets for games, it wasn't like one or two; it was <laughs> yeah, yeah, 10, 15 tickets. You know what I mean? So that was that was nice. Um, but actually, it was quite strange coming back because people always used to ask me, "Ah, oh, you know." what if people don't remember you or what if people sort of remember the old you, what, what about this new you and all this sort of stuff. And I was like, well, we'll look back at the the times I played for Reading at the start, probably only played five games and, and they were all off the bench and they were all in like the cups and, yeah. you know, for 15, 20 minutes here and there. And, you know, so I never really played. So when I came back, the first time I started was the first start I ever had for Reading. Mm. So it was, like, it was it was actually like a new club for me. Um, so it wasn't really like going back. I wasn't going back into the youth system and, um, you know, making my way through. It was, it was coming back as a first team player again. So it was, it was yeah. actually quite nice. Yeah, yeah. No, it sounds, it sounds incredible to obviously come full circle and sort of, you know, be back where you kind of want to be. The, um, the moves you made really interested me, especially the, um, the West Brom one, because I'm right in thinking... Roberto Di Matteo, uh, Di Matteo signed you for uh, West Brom. Is that correct? He was the manager at the time, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, because Roberto Di Matteo, I just, his story is just like, it's a wild one, right? Because obviously he's managing you and then obviously he leaves West Brom and he goes to Chelsea and then he yeah. wins the Champions League and then all of a sudden he just drops off the face of the earth. Exactly, like, yeah. And, and I just, I sat there this morning thinking about it and I was like, how do you go from winning the Champions League to just being sort of unemployed? It's such a weird game. <coughs> when, when he was coaching you, did did you see the potential in him to sort of be a Champions League winning coach? Listen, I think it's um, it's a tough one because when when we had him at West Brom in the Championship, we just been relegated from the Premier League, so we still had the you know the best or the second best team by yeah. Newcastle. Um, they didn't really have to do a great deal, I'll be honest. Mm. It was one of them, like, you know, put an 11 out there and that 11 is when you line up name name v name on, on the team sheet against whoever you're playing against, you look at our team and go, take every single one of our <laughs> So, you know, we, we should come out winners majority of the time. That's yeah. That was the way it sort of worked. Um, obviously, there was coaching involved and stuff like that, but... Yeah. It was then when we got to the Premier League is where I felt he got he came unstuck a little bit mm. um, tactically and stuff like that. You know, when you're going away this Man City and you're getting slapped four 0 and you, you you know you're still trying to play the same way as you did in the Championship. It's yeah. that's that's not the case. It it can't work that way. Um, and then that ultimately end up paying the price. Mm. Um, but then you go and get the Chelsea job. And Chelsea at the time were, were sort of not doing so well in the league, so hence the reason why they found themselves without a manager. Yeah. But they weren't they weren't playing because uh, I remember it. They weren't playing Lampard. Uh, they weren't playing Ashley Cole. They I think John Terry was the only one still playing. Yeah. So Di Matteo walked through the door and he just went Lampard in you go Cole yeah. in you go. <laughs> yeah. And then all of a sudden the dressing room sort of gets back together. And then they go out and win the Champions League and, and everyone turns around and goes, oh my God, it must have been a stroke of genius. And I'm going, really? Like, <laughs> I, I thought that got, same thing, yeah. You just got the band back together. Like yeah. there's no, uh, there's no like, magic wand here. Um, and then obviously like he goes on, wins the Champions League. Um, and then I think he gets the Schalke job after that. Yes. Uh, yeah. After Chelsea. And then I don't think he does ultimately too well there. Mm. Um, and I don't think he's there for that long. And then uh, then ends up getting a second. I don't think he's had another job since. So no. when you say, 
you know, what's he like as a manager? I mean, it's not, it don't look great. <laughs> but um, but he, was, he, was, he was a nice enough guy, do you know what I mean? Like, you can't, you can't knock him for being a nice guy. I was, I was looking at that Chelsea team that won it the other day, and obviously he, he'll always be able to say that he's won a Champions League, you know, which um, most people can't. But that Chelsea yeah. side that, that won the Champions League, it, obviously there, there are some good names in that, but you look at, like, the Bertrand, Kalu. Singwa, and you just think every every so many years a team wins the Champions League, don't they? And you just think, how have they done that with that team? Because you, uh, the, you do that when you look back at like when they put uh, old Champions League teams on yeah. the telly, and you look back and go, oh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they would have won like they would have won like five 0 in a game or something, and yeah. you go, honestly, how, how is that possible? Yeah, but, yeah. Right? It's no, like the it's Liverpool happened. side, isn't it? Spoon yeah, from 2005. It is, yeah. is that exactly it? Sorry, it, it, AC Milan was Adida, <laughs> Cafu, Stam, Maldini, Nesta, Gattuso, Perlo, Kaka. You just think one of the, the greatest teams of yeah, all time. Oh, yeah. 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 Was it Crespo? And you look at that Liverpool team, and, you know, not, not, not knocking it, but was it like Smitza, Finnan, yeah. Hibia? Yeah. Yeah, you're just like, yeah, how has that happened? Yeah, well, you can't, you can't get your head around it. I, no. I get it. Yeah, I understand it. Yeah. It's like, yeah. it's yeah. how when you look at that uh, AC Milan team, that would be a Liverpool fan as well. And I, I remember staying up for that game, and I was, yeah. you know, watching it. Harry Kuehl was in it. Um, yeah. Came, yeah, that's right. Yeah, came up at like half time or ten minutes in or whatever it was. He got injured. Shock. Um, but yeah, it was like, uh, you know, you just look at that team and go, how on earth? Yeah. Does that team beat yeah. AC Milan? Because yeah. when you look at it, apart from potentially like Gerard, you're not really taking anybody else out of that Liverpool team and sticking them in the in the AC Milan team. Yeah. But you take you take 99% of the AC Milan team and put them in the Liverpool team. Yeah. yeah. It's like you say, isn't it? You mentioned uh, at West Brom when you were looking at other teams in the championship and you wouldn't take any of them. That AC Milan side, if you'd have said, do you want any of these Liverpool boys? They'd probably have gone, no, nah, you're all right. Maybe, maybe, yeah. <laughs> Probably have Gerard, maybe yeah. Javi Alonso, but yeah, um, but yeah, you're good. Yeah, we'll we'll stick yeah, with us. Yeah, yeah, it is. It's um, it just goes to show, doesn't it? What a weird, what a weird yet beautiful game it is when stuff like that happens. Because the Di Matteo story is just it's, it's wild. Like you tell that to your grandkids later down the line, and they'll be like, he, he went, he left West Brom and went, what? He did that, and then never yeah. worked again. What? Yeah, How who's, it, who's, his, who's his agent? Paul Daniels. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, somebody yeah. pulled a rabbit out of a hat with that one. Yeah. Tell you because yeah. It, yeah. It's, it's incredible. But, um, if I was him, I'd be walking around his house with the Champions League winners medal. <laughs> yeah, he probably is. He probably is. That's probably how he starts every conversation. I won a Champions League, yeah. mind. I'm like, yes, <laughs> we know, we get it. Yes. <laughs> Imagine every job interview that he would have gone in after that. It wouldn't matter what results he'd had. He'd be like, but I did oh. win the Champions League, though. Yeah. 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 Imagine, imagine him going in for a manager's job, though, with like a dossier on like the, the team or anything else like that. And he's ah, oh, so why do you think you're good at, uh, why do you think you're the best man for the job? Champions League winner. Yeah. End of dossier. <laughs> It is, it is it is go to on everything. I don't doubt it for a minute. I, I it, it's kind of it's a weird game, isn't it? Right, because even from a playing side, I you know Roberto Di Matteo on the managing side, he can't get a job, and he's been some may say incredibly successful, others may say moderately successful. And then, for example, you know a lad like Daniel Sturridge, like Daniel Sturridge now, like I you know the Australian league would, for example, be perfect for him. Right? But I don't know. I think he ended up in Turkey, was it? Did he end up in Turkey? Maybe? Yeah, I don't, I don't think he's got. I don't think he's got a club now. I don't think he's even got a club. Yeah, and I just remember thinking to myself, it's such a weird game, you know, like the the way things pan out. But um, yeah, going back to the um, the management side of things, obviously there was a few others I wanted to touch upon very quickly. Um, Roy Hodgson was someone else that managed you as well. That's correct. Yeah. Now Roy again is he comes across as just the nicest guy, right? I know he's got a little bit of a temper when needs must, but um, he is one of those that he sort of he's not your sort of traditional English manager because I look at him and I do think he's maybe tactically a bit more aware than maybe some of his counterparts. But what was he like to, to, to sort of play under? Was he was he quite a nice guy? Was he sort of the Roy Hodgson we usually see in the press? Yeah, absolutely. Um, probably the the sort of grandfather figure yeah. that you, you would sort of look to see, you know, was he 
70 odd years old now yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and the rest yeah yeah so <laughs> like he was he was literally that every day um tactically very good again yeah. he took over from Robbie where mm. we were sort of tactically inept and and we were sort of naive in in the games and then he came in um and we did partner play every day uh listen it was the most boring training yeah. session and he wouldn't and he didn't want to do like little five sides at the end of training because of he had like a player get injured from five sides so he's like no mm. don't do five sides so everyone was like we do we do the boring stuff without any fun stuff yeah, um, yeah, yeah. and then um but he was exactly what we needed um so he came like every day he would take you five minutes shake your hand, say good morning, how are you, how's the family, you know, what were you up to last night or whatever, you know, how was your weekend on the Sunday or, you know, whatever the case may be. Um, But just a really, really nice, nice man. Yeah, he comes across as that in the press. He's someone I've always admired a lot. And I think when he got the he got the Liverpool job, am I right, Becky? And thinking that a while back, yeah. Hodge, and it didn't go to plan. And I felt quite sorry for him because he comes across as such a nice guy. And I always remember thinking if there's one guy I'd like to see succeed and just get a bit of success, it would be um it would be Roy Hodgson. Mm. I think I think with Roy though, it's he's always been a very good manager at managing the clubs outside of say the, the top the six. Top. Yeah, six or seven or eight teams. Yeah, you know he's always good at he's always sort of an overachiever mm. for teams who who overachieve. So at the minute, obviously, Palace he keeps them in the league pretty much every yeah. year. Yeah, um, yeah. To you know maybe a a better points tally every year. Um, West Brom he did it with us and um, did it with Fulham as well, didn't he? Fulham to a was it a Europa League final? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very close. Um, yeah. yeah. I think I think he took Liverpool to a uh, Europa League semi final or so, quite far in the in the Europa League mm. with Liverpool as well. Um, mm. So you know he was always he was always pretty good. But then when it come to the Liverpool um, job and potentially the England job as well, um, when you're dealing with big personalities in in the dressing room and people who deserve to play every week, and um, I think that's where he sort of yeah. Not struggle, but I think it's you know you, you're sort of having to let down people, and I don't think he really likes letting people down. That's it. That's an issue of being like the nice guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's a nice trait to have, but ultimately it'll be a downfall at the same yeah, time, absolutely. isn't it? Yeah. yeah, yeah. No, it's very true. Yeah, yeah. Um, I was going to say with them with West Brom as well. You am I right in saying you had would have been three seasons in the Premier League or four seasons back to back with them, and yeah, three, West Brom. Seasons. Yeah, I think I've, I've been one of those clubs typically, especially in the 2000s, that have kind of come back from the Championship, Premier League, and then they've had a few years back in, back up. What was the... Was there an obvious um, difference in quality going from a Championship to the Premier League? That Was there a, anything in particular that you would just describe as an obvious difference between playing in both leagues? Um. No, not not really. I actually think that the championship is um, is probably one of the most competitive leagues in the world right now. Mm. Um, it's if you look at it, it's littered with ex Premier League teams. Um, mm. I, don't, I think there's probably only three, maybe four teams that have never ever played in the Premier League. Um, yeah. but everybody else has. So uh, the diff- I think the difference literally would be. You know, probably speed of the game. You, your thought process has to be a bit quicker. Um, obviously, the pace of the game is quicker, but um, you don't get. Uh, you know, if you, you you can give the ball away in the championship, and if you if you are the West Brom and you you're one of the better teams in the league, you tend to win it back quite quite quickly. Whereas when you go from being the best team or one of the best teams in the championship, yeah, upside down to being sort of one of the not not so great teams in the, in the Premier League. You tend to have to work a lot harder. You have to, you know, you have to fight for every point, and you then go away to Arsenal's and Cities and stuff, and your tactics have to change. And that's that's the sort of mindset switch you have to have. Yeah. Um, but that would probably be the biggest difference. Not necessarily in more of the league. I think it's more you as a team have to have to mm. change. Because was it Matt Jarvis that was saying uh, Spoon? That you you almost said you get less time on the ball in the championship than the Premier yeah, League because yeah. it's so because it's friendly. almost 
yeah, in the Premier League, you because you're sort of more aware of the quality, and people don't sort of go diving in because you know you're gonna they're gonna probably just gonna knock it past you and punish you a bit more. And you said yeah. that you know in the Championship that you get less time in the ball because you know, like you said, you, you're probably gonna win the ball back <coughs> quickly after yeah. it. Yeah, yeah I so. think uh, I, I, I've got a mate who plays for Leeds, and and Marcelo Bielsa does murder ball. I think Championship. <laughs> He calls yeah. it murderable. So I think the championship is murderable, just yeah. pretty much murderable every every week. It's you know a hundred miles an hour. Um, mm-hmm. You have it, we have it. You know, kick lumps of shit out of each other. Yeah, um, yeah that's and, exactly. And, and the best team might win. Do you know what I mean? Um, that is exactly. Yeah. You go into the Premier League and it's it's tactical. It's it's yeah. if you give the ball away, you you'll be without the ball for two or three minutes, and you're running around and if you can see now you're under under massive pressure. So it's a, it's a massive tactical affair than it is in the championship, I'd say. Yeah, yeah. No, you summed that up very well because I remember watching Leeds play, I think it was Man United earlier on in the season and they kind of took that championship approach and it was like an NBA game and it reminded me of a championship game. It was just like up and down, up and down, up and down and it was so yeah. frantic and so chaotic. I, I was just, I loved the game itself, like watching it, but I remember thinking... Yeah. I, if I was a player, I'd probably have had a heart attack at about half time. Yeah, he says they do it on like a Tuesday or something like that, he said. And um, it's literally like an 11 v 11 for like 45 minutes or an hour. Yeah. And you like, there's no fouls. No, like, as soon as the ball goes out of play, it's back in play. Yeah. And it's basically man on man. So you've got, you've got your man. Positions are out the window. It's go, go, go. Wherever yeah. your mate goes, you've got to go, sort of thing. Yeah. And if you're caught upfield, you've got one of the coaches going, get fucking back. Yeah, do you know what yeah. I mean? Like, um, um, so yeah, it's it was it's like that. Um, and Leeds have been a prime example of how that can sort of work a little bit in the in the Premier yeah. League. Well, yesterday's a prime example. Yeah, I mean, you know, even um, if you need a better example, it'll be hard to find one. You know, that sort of gung-ho approach. Don't get me wrong. There's times when it looks very, su- it's like suicide football. You know, <laughs> it, it, it is. It's like they're just, you can see them getting, they're either going to win 8-0 or get killed 8-0. But yeah. you're going to have some fun in the meantime watching it. So yeah. in that respect, you know, you have to admire it, I suppose. Yeah, yeah you have to respect the approach, don't you? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Sorry, Becky, go on. I was going to say, no, it is refreshing though, isn't it? Seeing that yeah. because... It's so many clubs that have come up to the Premier League in the past and just tried to not get relegated. And you can see why they do it because it's it's so easy with an inferior squad and less money to get relegated. But you mentioned that United game spoon, you know, I think they, they went on to lose, is it six two or something I, like I that? I can't remember, yeah. Could have been eighteen nine, I I can't remember. Yeah. But but they they would not change their approach regardless how many they conceded. And you look where they are on the table. Were they ninth? Eighth? Ninth? It will take, yeah. And th- they know that they've got their own weapons. That, all right, it might not work against the, the better sides. So they might get punished. But I think their league position and Bielsa, the way <laughs> they've gone about it, has justified that, you know, if, if you've got some talent in that team, why not take that approach? What have you got to lose? Absolutely. I think I think you look at that and it's something that, no team in the Premier League has ever come up against either. Yeah, yeah. No. Like they don't, they don't come up against that every week. So mm-hmm. when it, when it actually you come up against it and you're under that much siege of attack every like every minute of the of the mm-hmm. game, you're like geez, give us a break, lads. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but then you you sort of see it for Leeds, but then you saw it last year with Sheffield United. Yeah. The overlap, yeah. the overlapping centre halves. Yeah. Playing yeah. three at the back, you know. So when in the championship, like I say, most teams tend to play a sort of similar way, apart from when you get like one team like a Swansea who are, you know, passable to death for you. Yeah. Um, most teams play a sort of similar style. When you get to the Premier League, if you take that championship and you've come and they haven't been like no team would have come up against a Sheffield United last year. Yeah. Yeah. In the Premier League. So yeah. when when you've got overlapping, when you've got Jack O'Connell going around the right yeah. wing back, you're going, Geez, where's what's he doing here? Yeah. Um, you know, that 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 will throw teams. So, you know, but that's that's what makes it enjoyable to watch. And and like you said, they could win eight nil and they can get slapped eight nil. So, 
it, uh, it just makes for exciting watching for everyone else. Yeah, it does. I think it was John Joe Shelby that said the other day, I don't know if he was talking about Rafinha or somebody else, but Newcastle were playing Leeds. And I'm sure he just, he asked one of them, he said, will you just stop running? Like, seriously, <laughs> you just, just leave it out. Like, why are you doing this? This is it's just unnecessary. You don't need to be running this much. And I found the quote hilarious because it does sum up Leeds very well. I actually said that to Micah Richards once. We played Man City at, at the Etihad. And I was playing right wing. And uh, and I turned around to him. And I was like, mate, just give it a rest. And he's like, I'm not allowed. I'm not allowed. What do you mean you're not allowed? Just give it a rest. I mean, what chance you got? Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's wild. It is. It's crazy. But yeah, salute to Leeds for doing what they do for uh, for giving us some entertainment. Now, yeah. from one one manager to another, there was another one I wanted to touch upon very quickly because uh, you played under Alex McLeish. I might be thinking that's correct. So yeah, ever so slightly because uh, yeah. we um we had Nicky Hunt come on and Nicky Hunt talked about obviously the managers he's played under and Nicky was like you know he loved playing under. Uh, Sam Allardyce. Everyone seems to love to have played under Sam Allardyce and all these sort of old school British managers. And Alex McLeish's name came up and Nicky was like, look, thoroughly enjoyed playing for him. And obviously when I saw your time at Notts Forest, uh, Alex McLeish's time was obviously, sh- shall we say, very condensed. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> That's the polite version. What, what went wrong at the, with McLeish and Notts Forest? Uh, I think it was um, Alex McLeish is sort of known for more of a direct approach football. Yeah. Um, and when you're at Nottingham Forest, you you have to play football the right way. Yeah. Um, and then when uh, when he came in and we had Dexter Blackstock up front and uh, Big Ishmael Miller when he was when he was fit, he was up front as well. And and it was literally from from the centre halves, it was like out your feet, whack. Yeah. Forget forget your midfield players, and then the fans were just like, oh. No, 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 we're not having this. Yeah. Um, and then results didn't really didn't really go go our way. And uh, and oh, what was it? Five, six games. I don't think it was many more than. Yeah, than it, was, it was very short. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so yeah, I think that was more the uh, the reason why it was. Uh, I think it was his style of play that he uh, it, that the fans weren't really overly too happy with. Mm. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? Because if that style of play gives you results then at least you've got a little bit of leeway. Whereas if it doesn't bring results, then it immediately becomes an eyesore and people are like, but what are we paying to watch here then? Because yeah. this is just, we, we're not even playing with a midfield. And it's funny you yeah. should say that, right? Because when Norberto Solano came on, we were asking him about the cultural differences of playing in South America and um, playing over here. And in South America, I see they've got a ball at breakfast, they've got a ball at lunch, you know, the ball's at the feet all the time. And he was like, you know, I came to this, he said he came to the UK and his neck was so sore from just watching the ball go from back to front all the time. And he couldn't grasp <laughs> it, but it, it, no, it has its, you know, as Sam has proved, it's got its advantages if it's done right, but it's not an easy thing to pull off, is it? No, no. And you, and you have to have a, an understanding fan base one yeah and you have to have an understanding owner and players yeah. because yeah. ultimately if you're if you're a if you're a midfield player playing in a Sam Allardyce uh, team you're technically looking at it going I'm not really going to get too many touches today but I'm going to be in for a battle when the ball gets dropped down there I've got yeah. to be on second balls and stuff you know I'm not going to be able to play nice football and try and pass through lines and anything else like that it's it's literally go up for for headers and try and win second balls and, uh, and that's pretty much your job. It's that that's it. So it is. Listen, it, it can be effective when you look at potentially like the Stoke team for under Pulis mm. for probably five or six years made an absolute career out of it. Um, oh, and, and didn't, didn't were, he just yeah? And Stoke, and Stoke were very successful with it. You know they yeah. they got promoted to the to the Premier League and stayed in the Premier League for. What was it 10, 12 years or so? And yeah. uh and it was all for direct, direct football. You know, no one probably no one had seen a long throw for a long time until Rory Delap turned up. <laughs> yeah. The, the the thing is that if if you're gonna play that style of football, you, you've got to be all in of new because it's like you, you mentioned Stoke and Peter Crouch was was quite a good target man, but he, he was known for you could lump it up to him, but then he would bring it down and he would bring other people into play, wouldn't he? And 
it's all well and good skipping the midfield out if it's for good reason, you know, if you're just going to lump it up and it's just going to get knocked back and knocked back, then I think people are going to quickly become quite tired of that. Yeah, but absolutely. I think Burnley have, have, have kind of got that approach sometimes. And if you make it effective, then you, I think you can win fans over, can't you? If you're yeah. sort of, if you're getting um, wins off it. Um, yeah. But yeah, in, in that you're case. Right. Yeah, you're right with, uh, you have to be all in because if you've got, if you've got some of your players who are, let's say, like the small Spanish type player that you yeah. want to pass the ball, and then you're asking them to play 50-50 balls and um, get into tackles that they would no- never normally be in, they're looking at it going, ah, this is not for me. It's not for me, this one. Um, but if you've got like the sort of big, you know, brute sort of midfield players who like your tackles and your, and your um, 50-50s and stuff, then yeah, they're they're obviously all going to be all in in for that. Um, but you can't have you can't have a, a mixed bag. It, it just wouldn't work. Yeah, it's weird, isn't it, how fan bases react to it? Because a lot of fan bases, with all due respect to them, they're what I call the egg and chip Brits. When they go abroad, the first thing they order is egg and chips. They can't understand then when a foreign player comes to this country and ducks a fifty. <laughs> they think to themselves, "Why isn't he in there smashing him?" I never. <laughs> And, and these lads are like I said grew up they, 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 they never even made a tackle like they all ticky tacky you know from the age of eight they were playing between the lines I can't yeah. imagine the culture shock it must be for some of these Spanish lads that come over and just yeah. see these lads just, just annihilating each other just smashing each other to bits but there's a massive there's a massive thing uh, I remember it being being said that all the, the foreign boys who used to come to the English leagues, whether that be Championship or the Premier League, and you'd be like, "Oh, they'd be really good from June, July, all the way through to sort of yeah, October, <laughs> when like the sun's shining." But yeah, yeah. end of October, November, December, January, February, you might as well send them back home to Spain or wherever. <laughs> yeah, because you know when it's when the weather gets cold and they're in they're in like training with hats, gloves, <laughs> and, and balaclavas on, then yeah, there's no there's no no point having them because uh, yeah. they're not not used to it. Yeah, fans yeah. over here, don't they? They basically cheer a big 50-50 as, as much as a goal sometimes. It's, yeah. it's, it's, it's just as exciting, isn't it? You're a big crunch and it's like, ah! Oh. But it's, it's, it's like, bad how, like, if, they, if, if nothing's gone on in the game, if it's nil-nil after, like, 20 minutes or something like that, like, it's, the fans are a little bit dull or that no one's really cheering because nothing's really happened. You see one of them hit in the middle of the park and that. And then all of a sudden, everyone goes, oh, go on then. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's like a spark. Yeah. That's what it is. It's like a spark yeah. and everything just then, all of a sudden, for some reason, players feed off that then, don't they? The energy. And then along comes another one and along comes another yeah. one and all of a sudden, it's end to end. And yeah, yeah. It, it, I suppose it is what makes the English game great. But I've always wondered how foreign lads just come over initially and think, what have I signed up for? Like, <laughs> this is insane. Oh, well, I think when they sign in January, I think they look at it going, oh, yeah. not sure about that. Uh, not not really too happy about the weather sort mm. of situation. But when they sign in uh, June or July for pre-season, yeah. when the sun's out a little bit, they go, ah, this is, this is like home. Yeah. And then all of a sudden you get to November, December, and they go, oh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so oh, yeah. Don't be down the river there. I, I think yeah. as a foreign lad, don't get me wrong, right? The, the honey pot, the Premier League, the money must be very enticing. But yeah, culturally, I, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe maybe I'm built slightly differently. I don't think I'd move too far from home either. But um, yeah, each to their own in that respect, I guess. I guess it'll boil down to the individual. Mm. But going yeah. back to um, obviously sort of foreign players and general expectations of clubs, because I wanted to pick your brains on Knott's Forest historically um, a very big club obviously with European success and like you said football needs to be played in a certain way when you joined them did not Forest as a, as a club I suppose how can I word this did they have the biggest expectations out of all the clubs that you joined given um, historically they were not, so big probably not not from uh, within the club yeah. um, it was more the older generation of fans who yeah. had seen European success and the Premier League and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, obviously, you, you see it every day at the training ground where, you know, you, you've got the, uh, the murals on the walls in the canteen and stuff like that and mm. uh, all the success stories and stuff. And you, obviously, you get the, the old, odd um, players who have been there past 
um, come in and sit down and talk to you about the club and all that sort of stuff. Um, but yeah, it was more from sort of the older generation of of fan who, had, like I say, had seen the the sort of glory mm. day um, because their expectation of people like Gary Burtles and Martin O'Neill who had been in that European winning team mm. um, and they're sort of going, well, you know, they did it. Why can't you do it? Mm. And you go, hold on, it was a hundred years ago. Do you know what I mean? Like, give it, you got you got to sort of <laughs> take it with times. So, and that, that was where, like, I think the players sort of understood the frustration because, you know, it is a massive, massive football club. Um, historically, a big, big name in, in football. Um, but there's a reason why it's where it is and it's a reason why it stayed where it is yeah. um, for the last, you know, 10 years or so in, in the championship um, because of behind the scenes, because of, you know, owners and the amount of transitional players that they, they recruit and ship out and get rid of and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. Um, there's no yeah, the, the recruitment basis. It's probably, there's no constant number of players staying at the football club. People, who have been at the club for a number of years, who understand the club. Um, mm. If they move on, when you've got foreign owners, you tend to bring in foreign players, technically, um, who might not know the history and, and frankly, probably don't care about the history. Um, they're there to to play football, and and if success comes, then success comes. Um, but that was that was where we sort of felt that. Well, me personally, that's where I felt the the expectation was purely and simply the older generation of fan. Mm. Yeah, it's interesting you mentioned that. And the reason I wanted to pick your brain on that as well was because on Twitter the other day, I put out a tweet about Fred, the Manchester United player. And this lad, this random guy just tweeted me. And he was like, what are you talking about? Fred's quality. Fred's Fred's a brilliant player. And I, I said to this lad, I was like, how old are you? And he was like, uh, early 20s. And I'm like, I'm thinking to myself, you never saw Keenan Scholes in midfield. Like, yeah. you know, I, 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 because I, I saw those days and I saw Carrick and Hargreaves, you know, left the European Cup. And then this lad thinks Fred is the benchmark. And all of a sudden I'm thinking, God, there really is a difference between generations in terms of the quality they may have seen, isn't there? Yeah. I suppose you, you would, it's tough because you turn around and go, you look at Messi and Ronaldo now, and then yeah. you turn him around and go, well, what about Pele and what about, yeah. you know, original Ronaldo and, you know, all of that sort of stuff. And it's very hard to, to turn around and go, well, he's better than him. Yeah. Uh, he's now and he's 50 years ago. Yeah. Because the game is completely different. So this young lad would probably be looking at it going, well, I only know what I've seen. Yeah. I can't yeah. know. Like, unless I was brought up on Keenan Skulls and Beckham yeah. and Geek and all that sort of class of 92 stuff. Why would why would he know it? Yeah, yeah. Like that's that that's the sort of be all and end all really of that sort of conversation. He doesn't know it, so yeah. he's looking at Fred going, "Well, Fred's class." Yeah, <laughs> Fred, Fred is a good player, but he's probably no, he's not on the level of Keenan Scholes. So, yeah. but this young lad probably won't know Keenan Scholes. So, yeah. in his eyes, Fred is the the, he's the, the one. one. He's the one. Mm. Yeah, yeah. It's interesting how expectations change, like you said, between generations and. Sometimes the, the bar gets higher and sometimes, you know, it gets, in, in, in Fred's case, I'd like to point out, significantly lower. But, <laughs> it's, yeah, the whole conversation struck me and I remember thinking, this is a mad conversation because I in my brain, I tried to love all and I was thinking to myself, if we all have grandkids and in 50 years' time we try and tell them how good Messi and Ronaldo are, they're never going to have seen it. And because time moves so fast, they'll go, yeah, but he's not so-and-so. And you'll just yeah. be scratching yeah. your head. How are you not grasping this? Yeah, yeah. That, that, that is it. Like, you know, I'm 33. I, I didn't know George Best and anybody else like yeah. that. And But like the amount of comparisons that you get of, you know, Messi and Ronaldo, would George Best have been able to play today? Would he be as good as them yeah. or, or whatever? And you go, I, I don't know. Yeah. I, I couldn't tell you. Because yeah. I wasn't yeah. there. You know, that, My- and that's the thing. Like you can only tell what, you know, what you're seeing right now. Yeah. Yeah. My my grandfather always used to talk about Eusebio. Yeah. And tell me how good Eusebio was or the one of the greatest you've ever seen. I'm like, ah, but 
he's not as good as Ronaldo, is he? And he was like, yeah. God, what do you want about? You don't know anything. And I'm like, no, you don't know anything. And it's just, that's it, isn't it, in a nutshell. Yeah. I've yeah. never seen Eusebio. He didn't he play in black and white for most of it. So, yeah. what do I know? Yeah. yeah, but that's it. Like, Pele, you know, was the same. Original Ronaldo. Like, I remember original Ronaldo. Um, mm. Because I was that of an age where, you know, into Milan, I, I still think he's probably the old time... Yeah, Best number nine there there has been. Yeah, uh, and and nobody really in my eyes is ever gonna gonna top that. But give it another 10, 15 years, and you might get flipping original yeah. Diego yeah, 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 come yeah. through, and uh, and and he's gonna come through and just be incredible. And you go, Whoa. do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. but you got to give you got to give it where he was back then, and he was really good back then. And you give it to the guys who are there now, and and that's it. Yeah, yeah. I glad I t- I'm glad I asked you about that because I was really interested, in particular the not Suarez case, the um how expectations work in football. So now it's good to uh it's good to touch upon it. Um, Vecchi, I think we had one question from Rich, uh, one of the guys that follows us. Um, but I think you kind of answered it already. Am I right in thinking, Vecchi, about Redding? Yeah, he. You did kind of touch upon it. He just basically asked, with you coming through the youth system at Redding. And obviously, you going back there. What was it a really e- easy decision to go back there because of your sort of uh, priors that you had there? Like, when was it you that pursued it with them, or was it them that pursued it with you? And and then was it easy? Uh, it, it was definitely easy, um, but it wasn't. It was literally done within the space of about three or four days. Um, I was it was I was at Forest at the time and um, we were about to play West Brom in a preseason friendly and Stuart Pearce was the manager and and he pulled me in to a little room and he said um, I want you to go to Sheffield Wednesday I want you to be part of the Mikhail Antonio deal from Sheffield Wednesday to Forest um, and I turned around and said no I won't I won't be part of any sort of mate weight deal because mm. normally in the mate weight deal the person that the club who wants the player gets the player they want. The other club doesn't so, technically want yeah. that. Mm. Um, so I said, I'm never going to go to somewhere where I don't really want to go and, and they probably don't really want me. They just kind of have to take me as part of the deal. Yeah. Um, so I said, if I'm going to go anywhere, I'm going to go somewhere where I want to go. And he said, that's fine. Um, they end up getting Antonio anyway. Um, and I got on the phone to my agent and uh, and he said, what well, would you go back to Reading? And I was like... Phew. Back home, absolutely. Yeah, it was was pretty simple. And then, like three days later, I was in the car on the way down. Yeah, do you know? Um, I, again, speaking of Nicky Hunt, when he came on, he talked about the power of negotiating his own contract. And it's funny. Before we came on this morning, I was reading about Kevin De Bruyne, and obviously, Kevin De Bruyne has just negotiated his new Manchester City contract all by himself. And again, it's another side of the game that because we don't get to see it, it absolutely fascinates me. When you were negotiating, obviously going back to Reading or to any of these other places, how involved are you in those negotiations? In those ones, I was I was there. Yeah, but I wasn't the one talking. Um, yeah. that's because <clears throat> um, I always I'm like an emotional person. So like when somebody turns around and says you're not worth that or whatever, I'll be yeah. like. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, it, it wouldn't have really worked then. But yeah. um, but I actually um, I actually did a, a, a renegotiation of my contract at South End, um, yeah. and I tell you, it was the most stressful stressful thing ever. Yeah. Um, because you you kind of have to put a valuation on yourself. Listen, Kevin De Bruyne is, I, I think that that negotiations. Quite simple. Yeah, he can ask for what he wants. Please. Kevin De Bruyne, do you know what I mean? He's he's yeah. quite he's quite good. That 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 yeah, boy. Yeah. So he's, uh, <laughs> he's all he's right. Said. He's going to be all right. Um, but when I was, you know, I was on the phone to the chairman at South End, and and we were trying to sort of hash out a deal. And honestly, when when he doesn't call you back, and you sort of sat there twiddling your thumbs and thinking, yeah. why is he not calling you back? And bearing in mind, you're still a player at the time, so you have to try and get your playing side right and um, you kind of can't take your eye off the playing side, and, but you've got to have a sort of business head on as mm-hmm. well because you think, you know, am I am I going in asking for 
way too much than the sort of wage structure there is at the club. And, yeah, yeah. you know, it, there's so much, there's so much to be sort of looked at um, by it. And I, I'll be honest, I, I was so stressed over it. Mm. I imagine it is very stressful. I was looking at the Kevin De Bruyne thing this morning thinking, I don't know again how much, how, how accurate these stories are or how true these yeah. stories are. But like you said, just the, the stress of the logistics of it all and the back and forth and the waiting for calls and then not getting calls. Uh, it's just, I, I personally wouldn't be able to do it. I'd rather have someone act on my behalf and be sort of you know, the middleman. But um, yeah, no, it's, it's very interesting. He looks stressed, Kevin De Bruyne, doesn't he? Oh, yeah. yeah. He looks like he's the whole way, <laughs> the world is just on his shoulders. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> Poor Kevin. Yeah. It's like you say, doesn't it? At a club like City, it probably wouldn't be. And for a player as good as Kevin De Bruyne, it probably wouldn't be that difficult to negotiate because yeah. they, they want him at all costs. Yeah. They've got an unlimited chest of money, so it would seem. Yeah. So whatever he's on, you could just say, well, I want more. And they'll be like, yeah. okay. <laughs> how, how much yeah. more yeah how many more zeros I, I, Kevin? yeah yeah i think i think that's i think you're hitting nail on the head there i think the power of negotiations is how much value you are to the football club yeah. for one and knowing your value um and he knows his he knows his value and he knows that if he was to leave man city and go to psg real madrid barcelona in, you know, anybody, they're going to be a much better team with him in, in the team. So mm. Man City are never going to let him leave knowing that he's going to make a rival of theirs better. Yeah. Um, so, you know, if he was on 250 and now he's on 350, he's like, sound mate, yeah. no problem. Yeah. Four yeah, years yeah. Up, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. One day, just one day, I would like to be in that position of power where I could negotiate something for myself that good. Just one opportunity. That's all I want. I just want one. Yeah. I just love to know what it's like to just sit down and go, right then, lads, how badly do you want me? Because yeah. you're going to you're gonna have to make it worth my while. I could absolutely thrive in that situation. I, it would be terrific. But yeah, it was good to pick your brain, mate, on it. It's, um, it's, it's really interesting. Um, I mentioned it again because Nicky Hunt, towards the end of his career, negotiated his own deals. Um, and he was saying, look, you know, he'd hash it out and then send it to a solicitor. And he, it, I think it's something he seemed to prefer. So, again, it just boils down to the individual, I suppose, doesn't it, in terms of what they want to do? Yeah, absolutely. Um, again, it's... Again, look, he probably did it at sort of similar time to me, was mm. getting up, getting on. So you sort of understand that... Yeah. What to say, what to, you know, what to want and... And how much you sort of feel your value is at the time, so um, you kind of it, it becomes a little bit easier. But I would always prefer, I think, for me to to have somebody else do it, especially after doing one myself. It yeah. it does become it does become stressful. <laughs> I can imagine. Now, Becky, I believe we've got our one to eleven to finish up, have we? Yeah, we do. I, I wanted to just ask one question that we we normally ask as well, Spoon, before we get oh, into the one to yeah. eleven. Um, we usually ask who the, the best player or players that you've you've played against. Is there anyone in your time in the Premier League, maybe a centre-half, somebody that you've just sort of dreaded playing against or just thought they were different with gravy? Yeah, it, it was funny because we were on the away trip in Adelaide and we, we had this, um, this conversation with a couple of our lads as well. And I always say it's so hard. It really is so hard to answer, purely and yeah. simply... When you're at the Premier League and you're playing against the, the Cities, the Arsenals, the Man United, the Liverpools, the you know everybody in the Premier League, they're all top top players, so it's hard. But then when you've been as lucky as I have to play at an international level as well, mm. and you play against the likes of Spain, Italy, Portugal, Germany, yeah. you know these these mm. are teams that are littered with superstars. You know people that you'd be happy to lace boots for. Um, yeah. And then you, you get asked, oh, who's the best player you played against? I mean, I've played, played against Ronaldo, played against, you know, Xavi, Iniesta, um, PK, you know, all of those. Yeah. Uh, then you go Buffon and, um, uh, oh, mate, honestly, so many, so, so many. Pirlo, do you know what I mean? Like, these are the sort yeah. of people. That, but then you go into the Premier League and you, you have, like, your Ferdinands and Vidic and you have your Terry's. Yeah, it's just it's just ridiculous. Um, so it's so hard to name one, yeah, um, because I've played against some incredible names 
in my eyes. I know that's like sitting on the pitch, yeah. but um, <laughs> what, just, there is just it, so many. When you play against those type of players, like you mentioned, Terry Vidic, Ferdinand, Javis, Pearl, do, do you, are, are you ball watching some of this to the point where you just think that they're, they're playing a, a different game to me here? Like this, like, is, is it that much of a gulf sometimes? Oh, uh, we played against Spain and I was just like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I played that. <laughs> yeah. Nah, it's, it's, it sometimes is that. Um, it really is. Uh, when we, when we played Spain, we played them at um, Yankee Stadium once, and honestly, it felt it felt like they had um, you know twelve players, thirteen players on the pitch, and we were down to like nine men. It was mm-hmm. that it, it felt like that much of a golfing class. Um, not that we didn't try really hard, um, but it was just you know the way they moved the ball, the the amount of time they seemed to have on the ball compared to the amount of time we had, you know, when we talked yeah. about the difference between playing the Premier League and yeah, yeah. the Championship. And uh, you step that up again to go to the internationals, but then you step that up again when you go into top four or five teams in the world. Um, mm. and that's And that's the difference. So, it, yeah, it is... I mean, I was, I, I, I'll be honest with you, my journey from League One level to international level was so so quick um probably three years um and then all of a sudden you go from playing against big bruisers center halves in league one to yeah. uh, ramos and, and pk and pirlo <laughs> and, and thinking it was rough this isn't it yeah yeah <laughs> so yeah, it, yeah sometimes you look at it that way but then sometimes you turn around and go it's 11 men versus 11 men and there's a ball in the middle and it's who can put one ball in, in one net, that's it. Yeah, in simple terms, yeah. No. Much. Um, yeah, we we know, we well, we always ask um, our guests their best one to 11 of players that they have played with. Um, sorry for putting you on the spot. Um, yeah. But you, we often ask for the, the best manager that you've had as well, that we'd like to be the manager. It's up to you if you want to put yourself in the team or not. Um, we would, but uh, you can be yeah. as humble as you like. Yeah. Pick whatever formation uh, you like. I don't get in mine. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Who, who would be your one to eleven? So uh, goalkeeper Ben Foster at, at West Brom I had him. He's a favourite uh, of this cool. podcast now with his YouTube channel. He's doing very yeah, well. Good, yeah. I never ever thought I'd find myself watching somebody ride a bike, but yeah, yeah. he's very good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Man. yeah. Um, but like top man, it was a, it was actually a, a toss up with him between him and uh, and Shay Given because Shay was oh, an incredible yeah. servant uh, for for Ireland, but mate, unbelievable goalkeeper as well. But but Fozzy was top top draw for me. Mm-hmm. Um, right back, um, Seamus Coleman. Good chat. Yeah, uh, excellent shot. Really, you know, just level keep going yeah. he just keeps going the level and and you see what he is now to to yeah. Ireland in, in Irish football so he's uh, he's there um <clears throat> left back um oh oh let's go center halves center halves um center half richard dunn is one good shout absolutely yeah. good shout yeah like honestly man man mountain of a man um Love the pint as well, so he, yeah. he goes. <laughs> yeah. uh, um, but probably not people. Not a lot of people give him credit. To be fair, like he was rapid as well. He was like a rhino when he gets going. <laughs> yeah. he goes. Um, so he's one. Uh, and then I played with Anton Ferdinand uh, at Reading for a bit. Oh, okay, but interesting. Yeah, yeah. Like, obviously going for Anton was like top player back in yeah. like when. West Ham as a kid and then um, but there was a season where he was really good at, at Reading as well um, so he goes in um, left back is interesting because like, I played with like a guy Nicky Shorey um, mm. at Reading and he, he mm. came to, to West Brom never gave the ball away right ne- wasn't quick just never give the ball away but it's like delivery was unbelievable um, and yeah. So he he sort of sort of fluctuates in it and out of it, yeah. Depending on whether I can think of another one, at the time. <laughs> <laughs> and at, at the minute I can't. So he's going in. Um, 
So he he goes in. Um, and I played, um, depends what system I played, to be fair. But if I play in uh, like two sitters, so I'm yeah. going to play like four, two, three, one. Um, so two sitters, Graham Dorans, who's with me here, who played with me. At, um, oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, honestly, probably I've never seen someone dominate a, a championship season like he did when we, we won mm. that league. Uh, yeah. He was incredible. Um and then I played with a guy who went on to have a really like an unbelievable career. Um, like, and I'm, like probably would never have heard of him at West Brom. Borja Valera. Oh, yeah, right? yeah, yeah. yeah. Went to, so, went to like, Villarreal or someone yeah. like that. And he ended up at like uh, Inter Milan the other couple of years ago, yeah. playing with like, Ericsson and all that. Um, trained with him. Never, never got to play with him at, at, um, at club level, but trained with him every day. And he was, honestly, he was unbelievable. But because he was, again, like similar, that like Spanish type. Yeah. And um, this was the championship and he, it wasn't, it wasn't his cup of tea that, so he, uh, so he went on and he actually, I remember talking to someone about him and he, he ended up having the best stats outside of Messi Ronaldo in, in La Liga. La Liga, what, yeah. Like unbelievable he was. Um, my three across the middle, uh, on the right, um, also, I've got on the left, Andy Reid. Good show. Very underrated yeah. player as Andy Reid. Yeah, Andy Reid, um, because he delivery was was really good. And then when he came to Forest, and you know, out that outside the left boot, and, and yeah. obviously he could deliver whip crosses and stuff. But yeah, re- really, really good he was. Um, so he he goes in on the left. Um, my sort of number ten, sort of in that in that little pocket. Um, <clears throat> I'll play. Who should we play in there? I'll play. I'll play Robbie Keane in there. Robbie Keane, Robbie Keane. in the position. Um, I'd probably say he's the best player I ever played with. Um, just Fantastic purely, talent, yeah. Just purely <laughs> and simply, like steps ahead of. Of everybody else, yeah, yeah. great um, celebration as well. Yeah, iconic. Um, and then on the right, probably play because I played with him, and he was he was really good at the time, and um, it probably never really had an unbelievable career or anything else like that. Played with um, Jerome Thomas. Um, oh, okay. Time. Yes, yes. And yeah. he, uh, for for the first sort of, for the first season we were back in the Premier League, that first season we got up uh, and even the championship season leading up to it, he was unstoppable. Um, and even Gary Neville says that he's the one who retired him. Um, yes, yeah. Do you, do you so, know, I was just thinking that as well with that West Brom game. Yeah, Gary Neville. Yeah, that's the one where he just, he called it quits, didn't he? He said, I can't yeah, do it. He said, I'm done. I'm yeah. Done. Yeah. He said, I can't, I can't do this anymore. So, so the fact that he retired him sort of puts him Mm. <laughs> um, wow. and then centre forward is uh, Peter Odenwingi oh the infamous Peter Odenwingi yes. yeah yeah the infamous deadline day Peter yes. Odenwingi yeah. um, honestly right foot left foot headers like quick powerful really really like incredible striker um, yeah. all types of finishes and the fact that he was probably the the main reason we stayed up um, the first season back in the Premier League, and then obviously it all went a little bit pear shaped for him. But uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. what yeah. year was that? The deadline day with Peter Odom Wingy. Uh, oh, 2012. I was just 13? thinking 2012. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, it's got to be about a decade ago, wasn't it? At least. Yeah. Yeah, was I'd it say so. was it West Brom and was it Stoke that he was trying to was it Stoke? QPR. QPR QPR that's where it was yeah gonna go from, it was going to go from West Brom to QPR it was when it was when QPR had like they were throwing all that money at uh, who had they having goal um, did they go, Cesar was it Cesar um, yeah. didn't they have Rio Ferdinand as well for a while QPR at that point yeah yeah, yeah. 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 Christoph Samba Crunchyroll wasn't it. Samba. I was who was I was trying to, I was trying to him the other day and I kept calling him Sol Bamba and I was like, yeah, so. 
Didn't they have um, Park Ji Sung as well? He went there. Yeah. 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 So, yeah they, they, that was when they you, were like for 100 grand a week for. Yeah. 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 <laughs> we, you still at West Brom when he tried to make that move to QPR then? Uh, I think I just left. I was wondering. Yeah. So that, that is why I sort of remembered it. I, I don't. I think I was sort of like away with Forrest at the time, and and I remember it. Um, and uh, yeah, I was trying. I was trying to find out the ins and outs of, of what was going on. So it was. It was around sort of thirteen. I think it was. That is class. I wonder what the vibes would have been when he when he comes back. You know, with the rest of the squad. How how are you treating somebody that's just doing that? <laughs> Have you ever seen that? Have you ever seen that meme on on social media? You know the old. Uh, I'm guessing he's like an NFL owner. The uh, the old. Oh, the old, he walks, walks in. in yeah, yeah, yeah. He walks yeah. In the, uh, <laughs> I'd, I'd love it to have been something like that. <laughs> oh man, I. Do you know what? God love him. He'll never live it down ever. No. Ever. Oh, it's always going to be a story, isn't he? Yeah. Yeah. Class. That's a good eleven. Yeah. That's a solid eleven. I wouldn't like to play against that. Who would you have managing it? Um, I'd probably have Alex McLeish <laughs> between him and Robbie, one of the two. Oh. Uh, I'd probably have Roy because oh, I really I, I enjoyed Roy, and I think we'd be tactically tactically sound. So yeah, no, if you, if you go for that team in the Prem under Roy, I think it'd be a solid finish there. Yeah, I think I think finish mid table. Yeah, easily, yeah. No, no doubt. Well, I think that's pretty much everything from us, mate. Becky, do you have anything else you wanted to touch upon? No, I think we got the questions out there. Got one till then. Really Super. good, yeah. Lovely. Another one in the bag. Mate, thank you again for taking the time to come on, obviously with the time difference and taking time out of your day. I've absolutely thoroughly enjoyed my start to a Sunday with this. This is the best <laughs> way to start a Sunday. So it's uh, it's been great, mate. Thank you again for taking the time to come on. It's very much No, uh, no problem, Les, any time. Brilliant, mate. Thank you. So we'll put Simon's um, Twitter and, and IG ads in the description below. Um, if you haven't subscribed, obviously subscribe, like the video, all out of the good jazz. Uh, we'll be back next week uh, with, uh, I think, yeah, with Paul Robinson. Is it Becky next week we've got coming Paul on? Robinson. Paul yeah. Robinson's coming on, yeah. So we'll uh, we'll have Paul with us then. Uh, but thank you again, Simon, for taking the time, mate. Very much appreciated. We'll be back next week. Uh, we'll see you then, people. Take care for now.